Hello, I'm Judson Cowan, the creator, designer, and illustrator of Deep Regrets, an unfortunate fishing game. And lucky for you, I'm also the world's foremost authority on how to play it. And I'm gonna teach you, so strap on those waders, we're going and running. To start off with, let's take a look at the general setup of the game. Now, it's worth noting that this, that I'm showing you here, is a prototype version of the game. So, if you notice some of the components differ from the version that you're playing with at home, don't sweat it, the rules will still be the same. To start, take the C board and place it face up in the middle of the table, ensuring that you're leaving space to the right of the board for three discard piles, one at each depth. Then take this port board, place it somewhere nearby, ensuring you're leaving again space at the right for regrets, and then space at the bottom for not one but two market rows of cards. Then take the Madness board, which is two-sided, so make sure you're using the Madness side. Place it somewhere nearby so that all players can see it. And then we're going to set up the C board. So grab the small deck of Dink cards, shuffle those, and we'll place them right at the top of the C in the spot indicated. Next, grab all of the Depth 1 fish cards, shuffle them, and deal them into three equal piles at Depth 1 at C. And then do the same for Depth 2 and for Depth 3. And the C board's now set up, so let's look at port. Take the 60 small regret cards and create a deck equal to 10 times the number of players. So in a five player game, we would remove 10 cards and return them to the box. Shuffle the rest and place them next to the port board with space below for a discard pile. Next, take the 10 blue back rod cards, shuffle them and place them in the indicated spot. Do the same for the reels and for the supplies. And then make sure you leave space for a second row of market cards. Now there's a few more small components. Find the metal fish coin the Life Preserver, and the Red Omen die, and place them somewhere nearby. Then grab this bag of Tackle Dice, shuffle them up, and draw out four randomly to place in the four slots at port. Then set the bag somewhere nearby. And finally, grab the Day Tracker, place it on Monday. And that's the basic setup. So now let's take a look at how to set up each of the players. Take the five player boards, which are double-sided and functionally identical, so each player will grab one of those and choose a side to put face up. Then they take their matching colored player dice and place those into fresh, grab the money trackers and put them on zero, give each player a can of worms, a lifeboat, an icon reference guide, and an angler's guide. Each player's boat goes at depth one at sea. Each player's madness cube goes to the top tier of the madness tracker, and the first player marker goes to the player who had the most regrettable day. With that, you're ready to push out to sea. Deep Regrets is played over the course of six days, each of which is divided into four phases. Start, Refresh, Declaration, and Actions. If it's the first day of the game, you'll just ignore the start phase. Otherwise, you will progress the day tracker to the next day. You'll take the first player marker and give it to the next player clockwise. And then if it's Wednesday or Friday, all players will get to flip their worms to the face-up side unless they're already face-up. On Thursday and Saturday, each player will get to take one dice from the supply of the indicated color. So on Thursday, that's a blue. On Saturday, that's an orange. They'll then roll that and put it into their fresh pool if there's space. If not, it'll go into their spent pool instead. Any fish that may have been revealed and left revealed during the previous day will be discarded to their graveyard next to their depth. And then we will refresh the market which on Tuesday will just be taking the top card of each pile and moving it down one to form two rows like so. On all subsequent days, you will discard the lower row of cards to the bottom of their respective decks and reveal one new card from the top of each pile, so that what was previously the top row is now the bottom, and the top row is now newly revealed cards. During the refresh phase, players take all their spent dice, plus any that they'd like from fresh, re-roll them all, and put them into fresh. This player spent the day at sea, so all of their dice are spent. They'll take them all, roll them, and put them into fresh. Alba down here, on the other hand, spent their day at port, so all of their dice are already in fresh, but they have an opportunity to cherry pick the ones they'd like to reroll to try and get a better result. So these two are already at max value, but these three could stand to improve. So, sure enough, we got a slightly better result. The player who rolled the highest, and in cases of a tie is earliest in the turn order, takes the Life Preserver and throws it to another player of their choice. The Life Preserver can be used to reduce the cost of buying an item at port or reduce the difficulty of catching a fish at sea. So in this case, Alba rolled an 8 and poor Fraud here rolled a 4, so Alba might decide to give it to Fraud out of sympathy. So toss it over, and then Fraud has that to use on his turn any time during the day. Now on to the Declaration phase. 
The declaration phase will be skipped on the first day of the game, but on all other days, players will choose to either remain at sea and continue fishing or return to port to sell items and resupply. They'll do this by taking their boat meeple and placing it in the appropriate location. This is done in turn order, so Alba being first player decides that they will return to sea. Fraud has rolled poorly and sees this as a good opportunity to return to port to gather their wits. If players have any equipment, they also must decide during the declaration phase which they'll take to sea. So in this case, Alba only has one reel, but they have two rods, so they must decide which to put on top and then tuck them back under their player board to equip. Now these items will remain equipped until the end of the day. They can't be changed until the following day's declaration phase. Last but not least, the action phase is going to form the bulk of each day. So during this phase, each player is going to take turns going clockwise, performing one action on their turn. Once a player can take no more actions, they have to pass. And once all but one player has passed, that player will only have two actions remaining before the sun sets, the seas become dangerous, and play proceeds to the next day. Most of your time in the game is going to be spent at sea, fishing up god-awful abominations. And some actual fish, too. Now, there's only two actions you can take at sea. One is the fishing action, and the other one is abandoning ship. But you can only abandon ship once per game, and it's pretty risky, so the majority of your time is going to be spent fishing. But that's what we came here to do, right? So, let's look at the anatomy of a fish, and then we'll talk through the fishing action. Fish have four major attributes. Their value is printed in the upper left-hand corner in the gold circle. This indicates what they'll sell for and what they'll be worth at the end of the game. Their difficulty is printed in the upper right-hand corner, and this is what you have to spend in dice value to catch them. So this would cost one, this would cost three, and this would cost four value worth of dice. At the top of the card, we have their name, size, and type. So this one is small and foul, this one is middling and fair, and this one is large and fair. You'll also notice that foul fish have a green border, and fair fish a blue border. Down at the bottom of the card, we have any abilities, some flavor text, and a reminder of the depth the fish came from. You'll also notice this red icon here. This indicates that when you sell a foul fish, you must draw one regret. There are four types of fish abilities. The first is catch abilities. These trigger immediately when caught. This one has a catch ability where I have to draw one regret, but I get to peek at one fish. There's also reveal abilities. These trigger immediately when the fish is revealed. But this one would force me to reroll one of my fresh dice. Static abilities like this are always in effect, so I'd have to catch this with two dice. And lastly, some fish have eat abilities, which allow you to discard them to gain various benefits. There's also one important thing to be aware of on the back of each fish card, the shadows. So if we flip these over and look at the backs of them, we'll notice that there are different sizes of shadows on every card. This is a small shadow, it's contained entirely behind the numeral. A medium shadow gets very close to the edges of the card, and a large shadow expands beyond the card on both sides. Take a look at this player reference card. It has ranges of difficulties for all sizes of fish at all three depths. You can reference this card to make an informed decision about where you think you can afford to fish. Always do your research before revealing. Now this is all great, but how do you fish? Well, fishing is a single action with four steps to it, and they're printed for ease of use on your player reference card here. So the first step is reveal, the second is trigger, the third is pay, and the final one is catch. And we'll go into each of these in more detail. And then we'll talk about catching dinks, which is your alternative if you're unable to or choose not to catch fish. So as discussed, the first thing I want to do is check my angler's guide and look at the shadows to decide where I want to fish. I actually have quite a lot of dice, so I can fish pretty much anywhere I want at this point. So I'm going to flip this one over. It's a whiptail stingray. It's middling and fair, and it costs three to catch. And then most importantly, I want to check and see if there's any reveal abilities. This one has a reveal ability where I have to re-roll one of my fresh dice. So I would take a look at my dice and pick one to re-roll. Sure enough, I actually got a better result out of that. So he costs three to catch. However, I have a rod that makes all fair fish cost one less to catch, and he's fair, so I can catch him for two. And I can do that with any combination of dice that I want. So I'll take these two, move them into spent, catch him, and put him into my hand. The wooden dice when spent goes back into the bag at port, it's single use, and the rest of the dice will be placed into the spent pool. When the turn comes back around to me, I could continue fishing, so I could reveal this one, for example. Ooh, it's a bowel angel. It costs four to catch, and it's middling and foul. It has a reveal ability as well, so all players have to draw a regret. I would take one from the pile, take a peek at it, and then add it to my regrets. Now, I can catch this fish for four. However, I can't spend half dice, and I only have threes, so I'm going to lose some points somewhere. 
First thing I need to do, however, is drop sinkers to get to its level. I can only fish at my depth or above, so I need to move my boat down by spending one dice of any value. Then I would need to spend the remaining six to catch it, putting this one back at port, taking the fish, and putting it into my hand. If at any stage of the fishing action you're unable to afford the fish or choose not to for whatever reason, you would instead need to spend one entire die of any value to draw the top card of the dink deck. These dinks are actually pretty powerful little cards that can do things like reduce the difficulty of fish, reduce the cost of items, increase or decrease your madness. They have varying effects and can be instrumental for an effective game. Note that you must have at least one fresh dice in order to take the fishing action. So if I didn't want to pass, I could try eating some fish to get dice back. This one doesn't help me because it only increments, but this one, if I eat it, I'm allowed to refresh one dice and draw one regret. So I could take one of these, roll it, put it into fresh, and then discard this to its respective graveyard. And now I'm set to continue fishing. Now keep in mind, there's a lot of tactics you can use to help you land that whopper. You might have equipment like this rod, which reduces the difficulty of every foul fish by one. Very useful to have. You might have some dinks you could use. Each of these reduces the difficulty of fish by one. I could also throw some items I bought at port in there. I could eat some fish in my possession to increment dice or to refresh existing dice. And if I had the life preserver, I could use that too. All of these in any combination. Any means necessary, get that fish in your boat. The only other action you can perform at sea is to abandon ship. If you haven't flipped your lifeboat, you can flip it to the opposite side to immediately make port. However, this gives you a massive 10 regrets at the end of the game. While it doesn't count as a regret card, it does count towards the total value of regrets when you're calculating scores at the end of the game. Once you've flipped your lifeboat, it can never be flipped back. It's a drastic way to get back to port in a hurry to mount fish, but it could be disastrous. So let's take a look at port. At port, there are three actions you can take, buy, sell, and mount. And you only take one action on your turn, same as at sea. You'll be part of the normal turn order, so while things may seem safer here, you need to be strategic about the order you do things in. So if there's a particular bit of equipment you've got your eye on, make sure you purchase that quickly so that someone else doesn't buy it out from underneath you. If you're wanting to sell fish, be aware of what's happening at sea because the revealed fish can have an effect on your madness level, which can affect the amount that fish sell for. So be deliberate in your choices at port as well as at sea. So let's take a look at each of the actions individually. To sell a fish, select one from your hand. Let's say I'm going to sell this sunfish. It has a printed value of 4 in the upper left hand corner, but I need to check my standing on the madness tracker to see how it affects that value. I'm at the 4 to 6 tier, which means fair fish sell for one more. So this would actually sell for 5. So I discard that to its graveyard, and I would move my fish bucks tracker up to 5. So that's the sell action. Another thing I can do with my fish is I can select one from my hand and I can mount it. So I can slot it into any of the three slots on my player board which give end of game scoring multipliers. So at the end of the game, I would modify this value first by madness and then multiply it by two. I can mount up to three fish on my board here. However, be aware that these fish, once mounted, could never be removed. They're there till the end of the game. So the last action I can do is buy. I can take a look at the money that I have and the items available at port, and I can decide if I want to pick up some tackle to take back to sea. So I could buy some of these dice. The blue ones cost one, the green ones are two, and the orange ones are three. So say I wanted to buy this green dice, I would take that, I would move my fish buck tracker down two, then I would roll it and place it into the fresh side of my player board as long as my max dice allows. So right now my max dice is five and I have five dice, so I'm fine, but if I was to buy another dice, it would go straight into spent and I can move it in on a subsequent day. I can also buy any of the items from the two market rows. This one costs three, four, and two. I have three left to spend. I like the look of this rod, so I'm gonna go ahead and pay my last three fish bucks, take this rod, tuck it under the slot on my player board, and that will make all fair fish cost one less in the future. And that's all the actions you can take at port. Note that any dice and items should be immediately replaced when purchased. I've been trying to push them down and ignore them, but it's time. It's time that we talked about regrets. Various cards and effects throughout the game will cause you to draw or discard regrets cards, like the four that I have here. As you collect regrets, they'll affect your standing on the madness tracker. The number that you have is public knowledge and visible to all players at all times, but printed on the back is a value between 0 and 3. 
and at the end of the game, the player with the highest value of regrets will have to discard their most valuable fish. Let's take a closer look. The Madness Tracker affects a couple of things. The number of regrets cards that I have affects my standing, and then it affects the value of fish and the number of dice I can have. As I gain regrets, I'll adjust my standing on the tracker. So I could have one, two, three cards and stay at this tier, but the second I got a fourth one, I'd need to slide my cube down to the four to six tier. Over the course of the game, I'm going to gain lots and lots of regrets. I might wind up all the way at the bottom, which would give me a $1 discount on every purchase at port. So let's take a look at how this affects values. Here we have a small and foul fish that's worth zero, and this is a middling and fair fish with a printed value of four. So at the start of the game, this would be worth zero, and this would be worth six. But over the course of the game, as I gain madness, I might wind up at the bottom, and now this is worth two, and this is worth two. So your standing on the madness tracker can have a massive impact on the value of fish, both for selling and for end of game scoring. Madness also affects the max dice you can have in fresh at any one time. So I'm currently at the four to six tier, meaning I can have five fresh dice. So I could roll the ones I have and put them in. I could purchase another one in port, roll that, put it into fresh. I could purchase a second one, and I'm then at my max dice of five. So if I purchased a, another dice, that would go straight into spent instead. And then it could move into fresh on subsequent days refresh phases. Note that you never have to move dice out of fresh if your madness decreases. Max dice only affects the amount you can move into fresh. If an effect ever causes you to draw a regret card, you would draw that from the top of the regrets pile, take a peek at it, and put it secretly into your hand. If the regrets pile is ever empty, you would need to draw from the top of the discard pile instead. If the discard pile is ever empty, you have to select another player and take a regret from them at random. When you discard regrets, you'll do it face down into the discard pile beneath the draw deck, and over the course of the game, regrets may start to circulate between the players. Once all players have passed on the final day, the game is over and it's time to count up your regrets. Regrets are actually the first thing we need to look at for end of game scoring. We need to flip them over, reveal all their printed values, and determine who has the highest total value and will lose their most valuable mounted fish. So Fraud has flipped his lifeboat, and but he's actually done pretty well for printed values here. So he's only got a total of four plus the lifeboat for 14. Whereas if we look at Alba, they have not flipped their lifeboat, but they've done very poorly on printed values and they actually have a total of 15. So in the end, it's Alba that loses their most valuable fish. And in this case, it's the Magna Pinna Squid. So we take that, discard it, and it's removed from end of game scoring. So once we've dealt with regrets, it's time to count up all of the remaining scores. So mounted fish, have their value first modified by your standing on the madness tracker and then multiplied by the modifier on the mount. So all of your mounted fish will be calculated and then we would look at fish in hand. All fish in hand are scored by their printed value modified by your standing on the madness tracker, noting that each player will have their own madness standing. And then the last thing to score is looking at fish bucks. So you'll get one point for every two. So this is worth two points and this is worth three. With all of those things added up, we have the player's final scores. So let's score Bert, for example. Bert has found himself near the bottom of the madness tracker, so all of his fair fish are worth one less, and all of his foul fish are worth one more. So let's take a look at all of his fish, starting with the Bowel Angel. It's got a printed value of five, but it's modified by one for six, times two for 12. The Orfish is fair, so it gets a minus one, so it goes down to five times three for 15. And then over here on the right, you can't really see it, but it's an eye fish. It's worth zero, but it gets a plus one, so it's gonna be one times two for two points. And we'll take a look at the fish in his hand. Looks like these are both fair fish, and they're gonna get a minus one modifier, so instead of four, they'll each be worth three and three. He also has three fish bucks remaining. He'll get one point for that, bringing his total score to 37 points. You did all right, Bert. In the case of a tie, the player with the lowest value of regrets would win, and if they're still tied, the player with the fewest number of regret cards would win. So here, Enid would be the winner. And now it's time to switch hats and talk about solo mode. In solo mode, you get to take on the role of a Jacques Cousteau type who's out there trying to catch and survey every fish in the ocean. Or you can play collaboratively as a team of ichthyologists. But regardless, your objective is to, over the course of dozens of games, document every single fish in the sea and all of its attributes. 
Depending on how well you do per game, you can unlock equipment that is then usable for all future games. And at the end of the campaign, what you're going to have is a nice document that other players can use to make decisions about when and where they want to fish. Now, setup for this is very similar to multiplayer mode, but there's a few differences and we'll go into those now. To start, find and remove all of these fish from the game. If you've added any expansion fish, make sure those are located and removed as well. Set up the seaboard exactly as described in multiplayer, so dinks at the top, three depths, nine shoals, you're all set up there. Select a player board, doesn't matter which one, place it nearby, grab your matching player dice, put your boat meeple at depth one, give yourself a can of worms, find this ocean survey board on the back of the madness tracker and put it nearby with the day tracker on Monday, shuffle all 60 regrets and place them on the board with space nearby for a discard pile, then grab a sheet from the ocean survey pad, and if this is your first game, then you're ready to go. If you're continuing a campaign, check to see what items and equipment you've unlocked and place them nearby. If you've unlocked any rods or reels, you can equip them immediately at the start of the game. So I'll go ahead and tuck this rod right here. And then if you've unlocked any dice, there is no max dice, so go ahead and roll them and put them all into fresh. And then we're ready to go. So we'll clock in at the start of each day by moving the day tracker up. If there are any fish still revealed at sea, we'll make sure those get discarded. And then we're going to refresh all of our dice, including any wooden ones. So we'll roll those, put them all into fresh, and then we will check our equipment to see what we want to equip for the day. So we've got multiple rods here. I'll take a look at them. Let's say today I want to go for, uh, let's go for large fish. So I'll take the trolling rod, put that on top, and tuck that into my rod, and that will remain equipped until the next day. The fishing action is exactly as it is in multiplayer. I'll refer to my angler's reference guide to look at the shadows and the backs of cards, look at my dice, look at what rods and wheels I have equipped, and decide where I want to fish each time. So let's say I want to reveal this one here. It's a mermaid. It costs four to catch, and it's middling and foul, so I would spend all four of my dice to catch that, noting that tackle dice are not returned to the bag in solo mode. They're used for the entire game. So I'll now take that fish and put it into my supply, remembering to trigger any catch abilities. I've caught myself a mermaid here. It is a depth two middling fish and it's foul. So I need to find the correct place on my catalog to write its details. It's got a value of four. I'll put that here in this column. It's got a difficulty of four as well. I'll write its name down here. It's a mermaid and its type is foul. And for now I'm done. There's a checkbox here that I'll leave unchecked until I successfully bring this fish back to port. So now it goes in my creel and I can continue fishing. Once I'm out of dice, the game progresses to the next day, and I'm ready to do it all again. There's a few key differences to note in solo mode. You can't eat fish, so ignore all eat abilities. Also ignore any abilities that require you to flip the fish coin. So if you're asked to do that, just don't do it. Any abilities that give you fish bucks should be ignored, and any abilities that target other players are also ignored. If something asks you to discard an item, instead flip it face down. Another key difference to note is that if you drop sinkers and move your boat down, your boat remains at that depth until the end of the game, unless you drop another sinker or an effect causes it to move. Things wrap up on Friday once you have spent all of your dice and can take no further actions. Now at the end of each game, I'm going to have to discard a value of fish equal to the value of regrets I've collected. So let's take a look at my catch. I've caught all of these fish and these are all of my regrets. So I've got, let's see. Six. I've got seven value worth of regrets here. I need to lose seven value worth of fish. And I can do this in any order that I want. I could lose the store worm for all seven of it, or I could make a strategic decision to do some other ones. So for example, I've already caught these two in a previous game. It's eight value, but it would cover my cost and regrets. So I'm gonna to choose to discard these two cards. All the fish that remain are the ones I've successfully brought back to port. So now I can come in and check them off my list. So, once I have checked off all of the fish that I successfully brought back to port on my survey sheet, I get to use the value of those fish to permanently unlock equipment for use in all future solo games. These are the fish I've successfully brought back to port. Their printed value is what I'm working with since Madness is not in effect in solo mode. So I've got 18 worth of value I could spend here on various items. So I would pick the ones I want and check them off the list. So let's say this game, I'm gonna buy the mermaid eyes and the, let's say, I'm gonna do the black tea as well. I then take those items and I have them to use in all future solo games. Any value that I don't spend at the end of this game is lost. So now, I'm ready to either immediately dive back in and play another game, or I can table it for another day. I've got it all documented right here. I can pick it back up exactly where I left it in the future. And that is how you solo Deep Regrets. And that is all you need to know to play Deep Regrets. 
There are some really, really weird fish and equipment out there that have wild effects in the way the game plays, but I'm gonna leave you to discover that on your own. Half the fun of the game, after all, is the mystery of exploring the terrifying deep. Now you go on and have yourself a miserable time at sea, and we'll see you if you make it back.